friends, and welcome to another WSIB Truth Matters with Joe Machado on this beautiful Monday afternoon. Um, I hope you had a nice Father's Day weekend. Uh, we had a great weekend here at the house. Uh, we had my daughter and son-in-law over with my granddaughter, and uh, my son was here, and um, we had a beautiful dinner, spent the day together. It was just amazing, and I'm sure uh, some of you had family over as well. Uh, it was great. Uh, definitely one of the times that uh, fills my heart with joy is uh, having all of my uh, my kids family under one roof. The weather was nice as well so that makes uh, the weekends also very good. Um, anyway, um, as the title or the thumbnail of my video says, uh, WSIB's to uh, toxic culture. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And, um, you know, I I've been thinking over the past uh, several weeks and reflecting back over the past 30 plus years that I've been involved in this uh, industry um, and uh, looking at whether there have been any improvements uh, to the system over the years, anything that that I could actually say, you know what, this was good. They did something good to fulfill their uh, mandate to injured workers and also to employers. Because as you know, or as I've said before, I'm an employer. I've been an employer as well. So... And I'm also an injured worker. So I, I get a bit of a different perspective on the whole business part of it, as well as how laws and policies and the whole infrastructure of the WSIB affects uh, injured workers. And so that perspective gives me an opportunity to uh, look at uh, what, if any, improvements there have been. Um, sadly, I... I can't come up with any at all. Um, most people who know me know that I'm an optimist. I always look for the positive in things. Um, and then if something's negative in my business or my life, I try to make it positive as well as for those around me. I'm just not a negative thinker. But I can't find anything positive whatsoever about the WSIB and what they've done over the last 30 years that has had a positive impact on the two demographic groups that they serve, which is the injured workers and employers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can do comparisons uh, between pre-1990 claims um, and Bill 101 claims and Bill 162 claims that came after January 1st, 1990, and then Bill 99 claims and the legislative changes and policy changes. Um, yeah, I, I can come up with um, some scenarios where uh, in some cases it was good in one particular legislation and others it wasn't. Uh, but that you're going to find that in any government organization that um, provides that their main service to, is to provide service to their constituents. And they're governed by laws and regulations and policies such as like unemployment insurance and Ontario Disability Support Program, program and organizations of that nature. But in my opinion, this is a far deeper problem it goes much deeper than legislation. Um, in fact, I think that legislation, for the better part, was re written and enacted with by legislators with good intent. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But I believe the problem is deeper. It's, it's a much deeper rooted problem. And that's what I'm referring to as a toxic culture. Um, we have an organization with the WSIB that is top heavy. What I mean by that is their upper management, their executive managers, directors, vice presidents, they've got over 20 vice presidents, um, 
all of these people that are drawing the most significant revenue from the fund to pay themselves. They suck up all of the juice. Um, I don't believe that it's necessary to have all of these people managing 3,500 employees. Uh, you have our government, the federal government, the provincial government that manage far more organizations and population and whatnot that are functioning at that level by comparison. Um, these are self-serving individuals that are creating, they create policies and processes and reg um, rules to keep themselves busy, to continue to justify their value, their worth within this bureaucracy that, in my opinion, is ridiculous, like literally ridiculous. And if you look at their um, annual statements where they're required to provide what their expenses are in the various departments and um, yeah, don't get me started. You'll be bored and then you'll get annoyed and angry, then you'll be bored and then you'll shut me down. I don't even want to because it's, it's a monster. It really is. And it's really not serving the two major demographic groups that um, that they were supposed to serve. And then, of course, the provincial government, the PCs, the Harris government, started the whole money for value audits and, and just as a way to cut costs in government agencies. And, of course, the PCs that are in power now, so they're doing it the same. And, you know, they've got this multi-billion dollar organization to give them a report to tell them shit that they already know that they want to do, which is to put out more roadblocks for uh, for injured workers to claim benefits to, that they're entitled to. It's pathetic. But we always target, and it's 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 a uh, human behavior that those on the front line are the ones that are often the target of stressful, angry um, remarks and statements against them. And by all means, some of them are. I'm not here to defend anybody, but, you know, it flows from the top. A corporate culture isn't created by those on the front line. They don't create processes and and different levels of management and these different groups uh, that are self for the purpose of self sustenance. The frontline people have no power over that, none, no control. The culture starts from the top and it flows down. And then it affects and it permeates every aspect aspect of the organization. And it's maddening when you really look at it. Um, and a lot of these individuals are just use, they're useless. I believe that if a parallel infrastructure were put in place that contained the majority of their employees would be case managers properly trained and empowered to apply the laws in a consistent manner across the board. Properly trained with the authority to do that. With a few managers making sure that everybody is working in that manner. Some of those case managers working to ensure that the employer group was continuing to make their contributions. Very minimal requirement there. 
you're either contributing or you're not. And if you're not contributing and paying your share as an employer, you're going to get a warning, maybe two, then we're going to shut you down. Easy. Because that's their only function as employers, is to pay into the system. That was the trade-off. I'm going to pay into the system so we have this collective liability with other employers so that if there's an injury in my workplace, I'm not, I'm not going to be sued and possibly put out of business. So it doesn't take a lot to manage that group. Okay, And then another specialized individuals to ensure that payments are being calculated and made in a consistent basis with the law in another group of individuals who are money managers that take the money that is brought in from the employers and invest it to grow that fund, to sustain the fund, to pay out claims. That's all you need. You don't need doctors and nurses Doctors, there's doctors that at the WSIB right now being paid well over $100,000 a year. They have been sucking money from the system for decades. And, and nurse case managers. They don't need any of those people. We already, you've heard this in other videos, we already have a, 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 an, an infrastructure in every community throughout this province to provide injured workers with that quality and expert type of treatment to help them treat their injuries. There's no need for the WSIB to be in that business. They don't even have the resources to do that, but they're there to overrule the professionals, the doctors, they're the ones that are actually actively treating these people and providing recommendations based on their professional opinion which is also governed by the College of Doctors and Physicians and Surgeons in this province. They don't need the WSIB being involved in any of that. But the only reason the WSIB is involved in that is that they can overrule other doctors' opinions and therefore cut off injured workers or deny treatment, which they do all the time. Return to work recommendations are best provided by the doctor who's treating the patients, not some schmuck in an office behind a computer screen. That's not their job. They shouldn't be there, but they are. And then we look at the appeal system, this whole appeal system. That the only useful purpose that they have is to delay and delay and discourage injured workers to, from pursuing their appeals. But there's an organization already in place to do that, which is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal. And they're not governed and under the authority of the WSIB. They can actually review cases, look at the legislation and policies and apply the law in an effective and consistent manner and they're lawyers. Appeals officers, I don't think one of them that I ever dealt with was a lawyer trained in the law. So the appeal system should be gone completely. Now, if you look at the parallel infrastructure that I just explained to you and this monstrosity that is what they have now, This one here would be far more effective at a much lesser cost than in providing injured workers with what they actually need, which is to help them return to work as quickly as possible to become productive members of society and feed their families and build their lives. No injured worker goes into work wanting or planning to get injured. Not endless appeals that only prolong the return to work process. 
because the WSIB begins this confrontational process which does nothing but create mistrust and antagonize a group of people that are already injured and hurting and fed up. And now they're talking about another attack, which is to force injured workers to file appeal within 30 days. Like, what the fuck? How much more can you do? And... There's no shame. But see, in a toxic culture, there is no shame because there's no accountability. And they don't have to see face-to-face -face what's going on with injured workers and how their decisions are affecting injured workers and their families, their entire families. So this should all go. They're a drain on the system. That system wasn't created to keep these executives, fat cats, employed to create policies to deny injured workers and to continue to put money in their own pockets. That's not what the system was created for. But somehow they have taken the system hostage to continue to feed their endless need to screw injured workers and anybody else involved with this system so that they can remain a drain on the system. There's an authoritarian mentality. The dictate, they dictate to you what you're going to get. And then they say, you got to show them why shouldn't I cut you off? Or why shouldn't I deny your claim? Never mind the facts. The overwhelming, overwhelming support, supportive evidence that person can't work or the overwhelming supporting evidence that the injury happened at work never mind that a worker is always put in a position where they always have to explain one of the Meredith principles was that it would it would be a non adversarial system the system is nothing but adversarial Sir, Sir William Meredith is probably just beside himself looking at the mess that they've created. These morally corrupt human beings. I don't know of any other organization that puts somebody in a position mentally and emotionally where they think that to take themselves out, that they're so desperate that they think that doing the unthinkable is the only way to stop the pain, the shame, and the lack of compassion and humanity that these people inflict upon injured workers and their families. In my company, years ago, we implemented a system within our office that if there was ever a time where an injured worker, where one of our clients was using language or an emotional, was in an emotional state, that there would be a likelihood that they wanted to cause harm to themselves. We had a system that we implemented in my office so that Everybody would be alerted that the person on the phone, whether it be a paralegal or one of our support staff, would keep that phone, a person on the phone as long as they could, but another backup person 
would immediately contact the uh, emergency people in that particular community or city to get them over to the client's home. We did that. And we had to use it at least three times that I'm that I can recall. But we did it. On what other fucking planet is this okay? From an organization that the sole purpose that it was created was to help those very people that it causes them to think that the only way is to remove themselves from the equation. They're still doing this today. I'm sure that you or someone you know has probably felt this way at some point. I was recently talking to one of my subscribers. And we've been communicating now for about three or four weeks. He had a It was a, a significant event at his workplace where he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress working for a Schedule II employer which are funded by the provincial government. It was such an event that he could not return to work and the WSIB accepted the claim and agreed to a permanent impairment. This is a young person. And he tried everything he could and he worked with everything that was requested of him by both the WSIB or the employer. Everything. This is a person that was already suffering emotionally. He tried to return to work with the accident employer and he couldn't. Being back in that environment just was not an option. He immediately aggravated this condition and they were able to find a, another employer, another Schedule 2 employer where he was able to move into that career and there was a significant pay reduction and he was compensated with an LOE to make a difference, partial LOE and then slowly but slowly but slowly but surely over the last four years they've continued to reduce his, his partial LOE and he had another recurrence. And they reduced it even more. It went from $150 a week that they were reducing his LOE to now it's $500. With no justification whatsoever. None whatsoever. He didn't stop cooperating. He continued to, to perform his current job. But they obviously don't know how to do mathematics or follow their own policy. Because they have to pay the partial LOE based upon the escalated pre-accident earnings of his injury employment and their earnings of the current employment if they were higher they have to pay based on the the higher of the two. It's simple. The fucking policy is clear. And I showed them how to use my system go to the case manager she was useless. He requested a reconsideration to the manager. She started do, dancing around as well. Still hasn't provided a letter, but that's told them already that, no, what they did was correct, and I'm going to send you a letter. And it's basically going to say basically the same bullshit that they got before. So now I've said we need to have the payment calculations by the payment department. Not these people. They're useless. They can't, they can't even follow their own policy. Simple. It's a very simple calculation. It really is. He's had to rent one of his rooms to a friend and had, had, has had to go to the food bank. But that didn't have to happen because if they had paid him the way they're supposed to 
and they stopped fucking around with his benefits, he wouldn't be right back where he, where he was five years ago with severe post-traumatic stress. But now we're going to the higher place. I talked to him today and I assured him, I promise you this is going to get resolved. It's not going to take an appeal. But to put somebody in that position, it begs the question, should case managers, managers, directors, vice presidents, and everybody within their executive branch who has a hand in screwing somebody over like that by blatant disregard for the law, I don't give a shit if it's willful or, if willful or not, or whether you have the experience or a mistake. <laughs> no. Should they be held legally accountable for the financial losses, and in some cases, worse, that they cause? They all seem to think that they have the protection of the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act. Although I have been speaking to some lawyer friends. And that sense of security that they seem to fail or think they have, they may actually be standing on very thin ice. The kind that if there's a rock tossed onto it, the whole fucking thing's going to go down. Because negligence and the definition of negligence makes them culpable in what they do in their actions. Is it time to start holding them accountable? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think I'll do? We'll see. In the meantime, that announcement I was coming out with uh, last week, it's actually going to be made on Wednesday. Uh, we had some last minute meetings with our developer to make sure that everything operates smoothly. It's amazing the way it works. We're going to be able to beat the WSIB on their 30 day appeal time limit. 15-day appeal time limit, whatever bullshit they throw at our members at WSIBSettlements.com, and you can be a member too. We're going to toss it right back at them in minutes. Oh, boy. Let's see how they deal with this one because they can't. We're ready for them. Um, so that announcement's coming back or coming on Wednesday. Um I have been asked uh, by some people, actually it's a very good question, I never covered this before, with respect to the uh, current class, act, class action lawsuit that we are working on, uh, whether or not it would affect their benefits or if the WSIB found out, uh, could that have a negative impact on them? So the answer is no, and I'll explain why. So the reason uh, the registration is being done through WSIBSettlements.com and it's not being done through this forum, uh, is that it's all held confidential. Once you make your registration, and there's very, very little information we ask for, um, it's confidential. And once we reach the number, our target, that we believe that we're confident to move ahead with this, and I'm not talking about whether we're confident that the courts will accept it or certify a class action. We believe that there's already precedent for that, and the courts will accept it. Uh, but we want to have an idea of our numbers. We want to make sure that once we go at it, it's solid. So whether it takes us three months, six months, a year to get to those numbers that we're looking for, all of that information is uh, confidential. So nobody, it's not published. Nobody will ever know. And even when we actually launch the action, action sorry, the action, it all requires only one plaintiff. And then others can sign on. 
So only at that time will you be asked to confirm your commitment and whether or not you would like to then be uh, formally recognized as a participant. So we're not there yet. Uh, we have a lot of uh, registration, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, interest, uh, but I just wanted to answer that uh, for any of you who have those concerns. That information, not even amongst those who have registered, because that information isn't publicized anywhere. Okay? So I hope that answers your question. And if you do have any other questions about that, by all means, send me an email at uh, Joe Machado at WSIB uh, Settlements.com and then I can explain it to you. Okay? So as always, my friends, um, I my mission is to grow this channel so that I can pretty much get in touch with every injured worker in this province. Not only pre those with prior claims, but also those who may have future claims so that they know how they can handle their cases, how to handle their cases, how to avoid a lot of the pitfalls. While we're working on a long-term plan to have this system restructured, and I believe it can be, um, we need to be able to help people and give them tools to help themselves now and the support that they need. Uh, and we can do that uh, through this channel and with WSIBSettlements.com. Um, so please, your, uh, to register um, for this channel doesn't cost you anything. You're not going to have any monthly payments. Nobody's going to ask you for money. Zero. I watch a lot of YouTube myself, my wife and I, and because I like to watch that kind of stuff. And uh, I subscribe to a lot of channels. Um, and um, I know that I'm helping them grow their channel. I don't pay anything. But I get the value of watching. A lot of it is entertaining. You know, you know um, some of them are home renovation. Others are homesteading or tiny home living, that kind of stuff. A lot of really good stuff on YouTube like that. So, um, yes, so subscribing to my channel will really help uh, spread the word and, of course, sharing my videos. It's just a very quick click and you can share it to your friends um, and people that you know that may benefit from this type of content. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that need help and you may not even know of it. And it could be somebody that you know, a friend or a member of the family. And maybe they're embarrassed to talk about it. I don't know. But there are people out there who need our help. And by sharing, you could be sending somebody a lifeline. Uh, so please do. I appreciate it. And uh, as always, um, watch out for my shorts, where I sometimes I post something on our Facebook page uh, about uh, a topic that's coming up. Um, so on Wednesday, I'm going to be making that big announcement. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, my friends, have an amazing evening. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care.